Yes, it's called. And yeah, and uh, uh, we want to share from God's word this morning. And uh, uh, I believe as I've been uh, pondering about what uh, God wants us to speak about and what God wants the church to hear this morning, uh, I uh, we chose the topic uh, that the mystery of the church, how does the church relate to God as God is our father and we are God's children and uh, many people will not be able uh, to able to accept that as we are children of the Most High. But from our readings and from the Bible, which is the voice of God, which prophesies to us that he says, we are the children of God. For those who are led by the Spirit, they are sons of God. And sons of God means people who build up the family name. So here we are again this morning because uh, the scriptures say to us in Ephesians 5 and 3, verse number uh, 31 and 32, it says that this is a great mystery. Now I'm reading right in the middle of that. Uh, it's a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So uh, to a lot of people who think with a normal mind, with a uh, suke mind or, or just the carnal mind, uh, it's a mystery. But uh, to us, it's not a mystery. To us, it is something it's, we understand it's a secret that's been, it's an hidden thing. But this hidden thing is made known to us who are sons of God. But uh, to those that are not sons, this thing about the church is hidden. It's hidden. But to us, it's made known. To us that have been given insight of God's kingdom. For us who know and how it works. It comes in stories and it comes uh, and it, uh, it it is something that we now as the church are trying uh, uh, want to make disciples of those who do not see this mystery. And one of the things that we do is that uh, we do everything from all the things that we learn and we must create a readiness for those who have uh, the church has been hidden to. We must create that readiness, nudging them towards a receptive insight. Now, by lifestyle and by the way we carry ourselves as the elect son of God on the earth, uh, we must be able to show the people the Christ, the mystery that the Bible talks about, and we must nudge them into getting the sight that we have already about God being our father and we being his children or being his sons. The mystery of the church is seen in, in so many facets uh, of life from the scriptures. There are, uh, there are so many things that the scriptures talk about, about this mystery. And uh, mystery actually means it's, it's just a secret that is made known to the elect. It's hidden things, and it's only given to those who have a year to hear what the Spirit is saying. So yeah, our keynote scripture uh, for this morning is this, uh, in Ephesians 5, in verse 31 and 32, it says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And there's the mystery that uh, Paul was talking about to the people of Ephesus. In verse 32, it says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. He was talking a, a lot about 
how wives should submit to their own husbands uh, as unto the Lord, and how husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church. And it came somewhere past all of that. When it comes to 32, it likens the relationship of a husband and a wife uh, to the mystery that is that concerns Christ and his bride. We know that we are the bride of Christ and he is the husband of the church. So he, he likens his relationship with the church as the relationship between a husband and a wife. And so he says, uh, in, in Revelation chapter 21, verse number 9, talks about the church being the bride. Uh, it says, come. You know, John was all in the spirit and he was all uh, uh, layering what the spirit of God was saying to him and showing him. And here in chapter 21, verse 9 in Revelation, it says, come and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife in Revelation 21 and verse number five. Uh, uh, yeah, in verse number nine, sorry. So yeah, the Spirit of God talking to John while he was in the Isle of Patmos. And the Bible says that he tells John, I want to show you the bride of Christ, the bride of the Lamb. So you can see from those scriptures now that we have another relationship which is uh, uh, an adjective, it's showing us that we are not only sons, but we come, uh, uh, it doesn't really mean that we are brides, but it, all it means that the relationship has intensified. We come uh, in a greater relationship, and we call it often as having intimacy with God, embracing the Lord, and, and building this relationship that is a mystery to the world, but to us, we've made known as the sons of God that have years to hear what the Spirit says. So yeah, it says, uh, yeah, and uh, and here again, we're finding there are things that the church now needs to put into place to be able to let this mystery not be a mystery anymore to many people, that it becomes a reality not only a mystery, but it becomes a reality. Uh, uh, we, we find in the scriptures that there are so many places where the Lord would show the oneness between God himself and the church. Like when it comes to the relationship between, he talks about the vine and the branches. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you have a relationship. Like it says, then it says, if you ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Now it's a similar thing like the husband and wife uh, relationship. When uh, in lots of the cases, when a wife wants something done, the husband says, yes, it shall be done unto you. Like the Bible is saying that if we abide in the relationship with God, as the branch that's in the vine, then he says, when you abide in this, then if you ask what you will, it shall be done unto you. And then he talks about uh, the sheep and the shepherd. Also, there's a relationship there because we know that, that the shepherd is always with the sheep. He doesn't let it go out of his sight. Even, uh, you know, if it gets dark, he's still there with them. Build a hedge of thorn around and he stays there to protect them. And that is the relationship, the vine and the branch. We got the sheep and the shepherd. We got God and his people. So there is a great relationship that is in operation. And this is the relationship that the Bible, Paul calls it a mystery. I speak of containing Christ and the church of Christ and the bride. So in the first part of it, we just need to talk a little bit uh, of the kind of relationship that Christ wants with his church. There is a relationship that Christ wants with his church. One of the things that uh, we need to understand as the church, that the church needs to have a caring 
relationship. It must be one where we care for each other, where joint must supply joint, where we become one body. As we become one body, as we are one in Christ, we are one even in the church as the body of Christ. It's a caring relationship. And uh, it gives us, again, the same scripture that we spoke in uh, Ephesians 5 about the husbands uh, loving the wives and the wives loving and submitting to their own husbands as unto the Lord. And we know that it all turns back down as, uh, as, as God saying to him that this is now something that he's saying that we should be in that place where we must have the similar relationship that we have between spouses. Similar relationship we should have with God. And it comes by a caring relationship. We gotta care for one another. Uh, if Yes, and then it says this aspect of caring is typified by all the things that we spoke about. Uh, the sheep and the shepherd, the uh, uh, vine and the branches, and 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 many other things. And it says also, yeah, it says that uh, John ten, uh, verse eleven to fourteen, I am the good shepherd. The shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known of by my own. So you see, that is a relationship between the sheep and the shepherd and the sheep where there is a talking relationship. There is a loving relationship. There is a caring relationship between Christ and the bride or his church. Yeah, in, in John 21, 16 and 17 says, and he said to him again and a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, and Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. Jesus said to him again, feed my sheep. And we know that, that feeding is something that is very uh, prime. It's something that we do. We have children who feed them. We feed each other as possible. And yeah, uh, the Lord is saying to Peter, Peter to feed his sheep. Now, the kind of food that we're talking about, Peter was talking, uh, Jesus was talking to uh, Peter about was manna, that Peter had to give manna to the sheep. So you see, this is now still falls under a caring relationship. Jesus, even though he was not around anymore, he was risen. And uh, after he rose, he found Peter stopped doing that which he was called to do. That was to do ministry uh, to God's sheep. And then uh, because Jesus was uh, so uh, uh, fond of the church and he cared for the church, and he comes and tells Peter, what you're doing now is wrong. You have left feeding the sheep and you are now gone back fishing. And Jesus begins to tell him that he must feed his sheep. If you love me, you see, the love for Christ is when you are in kingdom business, like Jesus actually was in the business of the father. When he wasn't as, uh, at 12 years old, the Bible says that he was teaching in the synagogue, only 12 years old, teaching in the synagogue. What was he doing? He was feeding the people that rebelled against his father. He was speaking to them, the scribes and the Pharisees, and he was doing the same thing that Jesus said to Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. Now, Jesus at 12 was sitting there and he was free. And we know the story that his parents go and they come back for him. And they ask, why did you do this to us? And G.M. Peter said to uh, his mother, he said, did you not know that I was about my father's business? So all Peter was doing was answering questions. Uh, sorry, Jesus was at uh, 12, 
was answering questions and he was giving them answers to the questions that they posed. And this is what he was doing. He was about the father's business, according to his quotation, when he said to his mother, did you not know that I was about my father's business? At the same time, the same uh, uh, thing that Jesus told Peter, uh, 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 and Jesus now himself was doing that, only 12 years old. And we know by 12, Hebrew boys have to know the Torah, the five books of the Old Testament. And he was teaching, he was feeding, he was feeding. As, as, a, uh, as a shepherd of the Lord, he said, cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So the, the, the church should be at a place of having a caring relationship. We should care for the church. We should care for one another. We should care uh, uh, for God's body, for God's bride. This is now uh, the church of God, the elect of God, is the bride of Christ, as we read earlier on. And uh, we, as the body of Christ, must care for one another. It says, love one another as unto the Lord. So here it is. It's the church has to have the caring relationship. Because we are one body, we got to love this body. We got to love this body because, uh, you know, the body will go to to uh, happy times and they will go also to sad times. But as the body of Christ, as a caring church, uh, we must come to the place of being able to be there for each other, to love one another, one another as unto the Lord. So this is a caring relationship. One of the things about the church is to have a caring relationship. The church with Christ himself was really, really, uh, you know, cared so much that he said, I want to do this thing. I want to bring back uh, the reconciliation between God and, and man. Wanted to bring that back. And the Bible says that he left heaven and he came to earth to be able to do that. And it was a caring relationship that started off with Christ our Savior. So here we are again, caring relationship. One of the things about the mystery of the church, the mystery of the church is when we see people caring for one another. The Bible says this. He says, how will they know that you belong to Christ? He says, by the love that you have for one another. When we go back to uh, the new church, the baby church in the book of Acts, we find that people really, really cared for each other. And they cared so much that there were no poor amongst them. There were no people that were going to bed without a meal. The Bible says that uh, uh, they, they cared for one another. It says those who had property uh, sold and brought the money and gave it uh, at the apostles' feet so that nobody had lack. There was no lack amongst the people. And that's a caring relationship. Uh, so we find that, and we know that two people who did that, uh, uh, that sold up the prop. Barnabas was one of them. Then Ananias and Sapphira also tried it, but they didn't do it like Barnabas did it. Barnabas did it as a man of God who wanted to see the church being cared for. And... Uh, and uh, Ananias and Sapphira copied it, but they didn't follow it through like Barnabas followed it. So yeah, the first thing that we speak about today about the church, how does the mystery of the church become known uh, to the world and to people that have no insight of what the church is all about? It will come through, first of all, as a caring relationship is a relationship that we care for one another the bible says uh, can the can if if in the body if one part of the body is not well if the toe is painful it's not only the toe that bears the pain but it's the whole body that feels the pain so it says that when one uh, is in pain then the whole body must feel the pain when one is rejoicing then the total body rejoices. And this is a 
boils down to a caring relationship. And number two on the list we want to talk about is an habitational relationship. You know, when it comes to <laughs> habitational, uh, when we talk about an habitat, we talk about uh, a place where the people dwell. It's not a place to visit. It is not a place that only you come there, you know, just on a on a on a uh, you know on a service morning or Bible study. But it is habitational, where you dwell as a family. You know, it becomes. It's it's not only a, a congregation, but it's a local family that God had placed together in all the people that come together to hear God's word and to be there for each other, to counsel each other, uh, to correct one another. And, and those things is what a family does. So it is, it is habitational. It's, it's the, uh, you know, it is habitational. The, 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 uh, the Christian walk, the Christian walk, uh, it doesn't, cannot only just be just caring, but it's going to be people, that dwell. We don't. We don't only. We don't live. We don't live uh, for for self. We live for each other. We live and we habitate uh, and we live in the presence of the Lord as people who are habitational. You know, when you when you see the habitat of things around us, we find that the habitat for fish is water. Uh, if you take it out of water, uh, the fish loses its life because of its habitat. Birds have, uh, you know, like the trees, they're habitational, they stay on trees. So, yeah, it is. So, the first one was a caring relationship. The, the next one is an habitational relationship. It's not a visiting. It is not something that you take uh, you take it lightly and, you know, just only those times. One of the things is uh, that you habitate, you got to dwell in there. you got to stay in there. So, so uh, from the caring relationship, it's an habitational relationship. Uh, this can only happen if they dwell together. We must dwell together. Sometimes under the circumstances, we live in different areas. Some live in Johannesburg, some live in Durban, but, uh, but we can still dwell together. We are dwelling together this morning on this uh, Zoom platform. We are virtually seeing each other. You are seeing uh, Tina and myself uh, sitting here and sharing God's word. And we are dwelling together for this time that we are here on this uh, uh, platform, on this recording. Uh, all we're doing, we are dwelling together. We are hearing what God is saying. You know, I have nothing much to give to you. I got everything that I give to you comes from God. Because we are looking to God and we're looking to God to help us, to bless us, to exhort us, to lift us up in the spirit. And here it is uh, this morning, we're talking about the mystery of the church. And we said, first of all, it's a caring church. Then the second one, we said that it is habitational. It's something where we dwell together. Even though we may be separated, but we're dwelling together. You know, our thoughts, our thoughts are like Christ. The Bible says that our thoughts, uh, God knows our thoughts. And, and if he knows our thoughts, then our thoughts, which should be the thoughts of us being his children, and that we dwell together. When we have things that happen in this family or uh, church life, uh, we must be at a place where we show concern. We are dwelling together. So this can only happen when we become those people that are the bride of Christ, where we understand that we the bride of Christ. So we find that the relationships is typified in so many things, like we said in the beginning. Yeah, we're just going to read about the vine and the branches in John 15, 5. It says, I am the vine and ye are the branches. He who abides in me, he who dwells in me, he who habitates in me and I in him, 
bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you desire and it shall be done unto you. So this comes through when, when Jesus would say that whatsoever you desire, whatsoever you ask in my name, I shall give it to you. But it will come. It doesn't just, it won't just come, but it comes through an abiding relationship with, with God. An abiding relationship, I believe, also we must have with one another, with the body of Christ, because we are one. So the second aspect of the mystery of the church is that we need to abide. We need to draw strength from one another. We need to draw courage from one another. We need to be there to exhort one another. He that dwells together, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Here we're talking about the church habitating together, dwelling together, living together. And here we find in Psalms 91, where the Bible says that it is a dwelling relationship. It is a relationship by being together and being attached to our God. Even as we, we read early on that we are the bride of Christ in Revelation 21, that we are the bride of Christ. It is a dwelling relationship, habitating relationship where we come and we dwell together according to Psalm. He that dwelleth in the secret place, he that habitates in the secret place. Where is the secret place? The secret place is you talking to God and understanding that you are with him and that he will never leave you nor will he forsake you. He will be with you even to the end of the age, as the Bible says. He will always be with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And that is a dwelling relationship with your God. You can, you can talk to him just about any time. You, can, you know that when you utter uh, uh, things to him, he's hearing you. We know that he... he is there for you. There's no time that he's too busy that he cannot attend to your cry. He will be there for you uh, uh, when the times you, you need him most. He will be there. But it's for us just to be able to recognize that he's there. He is there. You've got to keep reminding yourself and encouraging yourself that he will not leave you. He will be there. So, there is this habitational uh, 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 likeness of the church uh, to be looking as the bride of Christ. So it, it's habitational. You cannot, you cannot separate the branch of the vine from the branch. Because it is there, it, it relies on the vine. And you get, you get other plants, and they call it parasitic plants, where the parasite plant lives off another another living plant, so we find that that uh, this this we are not parasitical, but we are joined. We are joined in habitational caring by God, as we are in the vine. And if we stay stuck to the vine, then we will be pruned, and there will be fruitfulness. And we cannot break this uh, thing and say, no, I can do it by myself. No, you cannot. You need the body of Christ. You need Christ himself as the vine uh, is uh, attached to the branch. So it's a dwelling. It is a dwelling relationship. And, 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 and uh, we know what it is. The vine is Christ. And the branches, we are the branches. Then we dwell in him. We stay in him. Uh, through good times and not so good times, we stay stuck to him. And in being that, then the mystery of Christ and the church becomes to us a, 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 a it becomes to us this mystery that we're talking about. The mystery of Christ and the church. And then we also 
understand that there's got to be also a united relationship. How are we going to stay united? We stay united to Christ and we need to stay united with each other. We got to watch each other's backs because in this process of the mystery of the church, we will find that, uh, you know, there will be challenges many, but how do we do that? If we belong to Christ and we are in a place in the Bible that calls out the army of the Lord, we've got to be there to fight for each other. I mean, an army can't fight against itself. They are united, united in a united relationship. And, you know, it talks, brings it back to when we talk about a united relationship. The Bible is always talking. Now we go back to Genesis about this. We read this in, in Ephesians, Paul talking to the Ephesus people. And in Genesis, God was talking through Moses about the same thing, about a, a, a man leaving his father and his mother and cleaving to his wife. And it's the same thing. It's the mystery of Christ and the church. And also uh, it becomes a oneness principle. It says that the husband and the wife are one flesh. The Hebrew word for one is iat, and it means united in one. So when, when, when Paul will expound that relationship, it's talking about we being one with Christ. The Bible says uh, that uh, uh, Jesus made the declaration saying that I and the Father are one. He says to the Father, even as you and I are one, we want them to be one. We want them to be iat. We want them to be uh, altogether one. It's not united, but the word is one. Uh, the church, God wants us to be one, united and one. Just like God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one, he wants us as his people to be one. And this now is another part of the fulfillment of the mystery of Christ when we become one, where we care for each other as one. So here we are, united in one. So we had, we had about uh, three things we're speaking about. The third thing now, the first thing we speak about a caring relationship. If the mystery of Christ has to be seen in the between Christ and the church, it's got to have caring relationship. It's got to have habitation relationship, dwelling relationships that we stay in. And we're now talking about uh, a united, united relationships. So yeah, in Ephesians uh, chapter uh, chapter five, and reading from verse number thirty and 31 um, uh, we're going to read here uh, for we are all members of his body uh, we are members of Christ's body and his flesh and of his bones we are all members of Christ's body of his flesh and of his bones now we're talking about the united relationship. So, yeah, it says that we are members of Christ. We are part of his flesh and his bones. That's what it says in, uh, in Ephesians 5 and 34. We are members of his body, members of Christ's body. You see, uh, we are not called just a body. We're the body of Christ. So we are members of Christ's body and of his flesh and of his bones. Now, this is getting a little bit deeper when he says we are members of Christ's body, of his flesh and of his bones. Where did you, where, where can you correlate that with the scriptures? How can we say that we are of his flesh and of his bones? The Bible says that when he was talking about uh, uh, the communion once, with the scribes and the Pharisees, he said, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, 
you have no part in me. So yeah, when it says, yeah, you are of my flesh and of my bones, it correlates with the scripture when uh, it's in John 6, uh, 665, I think. And people felt it very difficult. In John 6, 66, some of the people left him because he couldn't understand when Jesus was talking about, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. So they didn't realize what God was saying to them in the flesh, uh, what God was saying to them. Because uh, when he talked about eating my flesh, he didn't talk about, can it's not cannibalism. They didn't understand it. Eating my, excuse me, eating my flesh and drinking my blood. You know, when he talks about eating, eating his flesh, and he talked about the communion table where we break bread and we say the body of Christ, which is broken for you, and we drink of the cup, which is the new covenant in his blood. So he was talking in the spiritual sense and they never, never understood it. So yeah, we're seeing that he's saying again that uh, we are members of the body of his flesh and of his bones. So he gave his own life for you and I, members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So the one time when he asked them to eat his flesh and drink his blood, he, he never said it was not, it was metaphoric. It was something that was depictive of what it is to live in Christ, to live in a united relationship with him, to be part of him. We've got to uh, eat of his flesh and eat of the word. Let the word become part of our lives. The word must dwell in us richly. Like Jeremiah will talk about the word being like fire that is shut up in his bones. So uh, normally in the normal sense, when you got things inside your body, you partake of it, you eat of it. So yeah, it is in the spiritual sense. Uh, Jeremiah said, because he's been eating of the word and he's been drinking of the Spirit of God. He says it's now like fire that is shut up in his bones. When, when they stopped him from speaking the things that he was speaking, he was prophesying about Israel's captivity. He went to them and he said, you know, <clears throat> you're going to be taken away into Babylon. That was before they were taken into Babylon. He came and he said to them, this is what the Lord is saying, that you're going to be taken captive into Babylon. And uh, they, that's when they put him in a slime pit. They said, what this fellow is coming and telling us some things like this. And they didn't listen to him. And they put him in a slime pit. It wasn't long after that Nebuchadnezzar came and took them all into captivity. Jerusalem and Judah was gone into captivity because this guy was saying it because he was so full of God. He understood that God was telling him things that was going to happen to, to his people. And they didn't listen to him. They thought he was talking, you know, uh, and they felt because he said they're going to, this king, Nebuchadnezzar, is going to come take over. He's going to take you all into Babylon, into captivity. So they didn't believe him, and they, but it happened. We know from scripture that it really happened later, but just for speaking truth, so all these things happen to the man of God. But we've got to understand that we've got to be at a place of a united relations with God. And if, if God could tell Jeremiah that this thing can happen, uh, that uh, they're going to be taken into captivity, uh, why can't he say it to you and I? He can say things to you and I that needs to be, uh, will come to pass. And sometimes we are not at the place where we can hear that. And uh, yeah, this is what God is saying, what God is doing. But it must be a united relationship. It must be one with your God. When you're one with your God, then you automatically can be become one with God's people, which is Christ's body. God's people in the church, we belong to Christ. We are the body of Christ, and Christ is the head of that body. So here we are. Uh, 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 united relationships is depicts the mystery of the church. When we become united uh, uh, with God, and you know, I think the crux of the matter is, first of all, 
uh, in order to be united with your brother, with your fellow people, which is one body, excuse me, which is one body, we not separate. The church is not separate, even though they are uh, different denominations, which is not in line with God's word. We have all the different denominations. But still, if we are led by the same spirit and we live by the word of God, we are still one body. Cannot be. There's no two bodies of Christ. There's no one antichrist and there's a genuine Christ. We know that there is antichrist, there is a harlot, and there's a bride. But the bride is one body, one body, united uh, relationship with, with God. And if we at the place where we're united with God, then automatically uh, we must be united with Christ's body, which is the church. And, and that united, and that relationship would show to the world our unity uh, with each other, relating unitedly, would show the church and uh, the world the mystery of the church. We're saying the same thing. If you go to China uh, for a meeting, and now you'll be accepted as part of the body, or even though they may not know English or you may not know Chinese, but when you go there, in most cases you go, you feel so welcomed because they are also speaking as the body of Christ, the message of Christ in that church. And if you go, then you link up in the frequency of that church and you link up with the, by the spirit of God, you'll be very comfortable even in a foreign uh, language church where they're speaking a foreign language but you'll be comfortable because the spirit will unite you together with that congregation. So here it is, uh, the mystery of Christ being shown uh, through a, a united relationship. Then there must be a representative relationship. We don't, we don't represent anything else. We represent Christ and his kingdom. So there must be that representative relationship. How is that rep representative relationship and now must become known in the world? Because the Bible says that we are, we are Christ. We belong to Christ and we walk in his presence. We make him known. Uh, yeah, so we become representative uh, uh, relationship. There must be, we must, we, we only got to represent uh, uh, one kingdom. We don't have uh, too many kingdoms. We've got one kingdom, and that kingdom is the kingdom of God. You see, the kingdom of God and the domain, the domain of God. The Bible talks about uh, Jesus he, uh, and his, uh, Jesus is seated on his throne. I can't uh, recollect that scripture, but he says that Jesus is ruling from the throne. No, 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 sorry. That scripture goes like this. It says, heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. Now, when we look at uh, uh, Jesus as representing the Father, he represents the Father in rulership and governance, in dominion as he gives the dominion mandate uh, to the church to rule over your enemies, like David said, he ruled in the midst of his enemies. And we know that to rule is of God. Because God said this to Adam, he says, take dominion. And the word dominion is to rule, is to govern. So he says, take dominion. So one of the other things is that we have a representative relationship. And how we represent God by accepting that which he said to us about dominion. He says, I give you dominion. Take dominion, Adam. Take dominion, Noah. And he says, I give you dominion to the church today for you that dwells in the secret place, for those who are walking together with God. We have dominion over all the enemies that we face. And all the enemies are not flesh and blood. 
It's not people. But in most cases, the enemies are when when God's enemies, when when demon powers and Satan begins to operate even through a body. We know that it can be spiritual. Sometimes it can be also natural. Like David had people, a lot of people that were after him, wanted to kill him, like King Saul wanted to kill him. So yeah, we see yeah, that we have to be representational. This mystery of Christ that we talk about is the mystery of the church is a representative uh, a representative relationship we must represent christ as sons of god we must be at a place where we can say like the scriptures say about david the scriptures say about david he says and the feeble the feeble amongst in the and uh, the feeble will be as David. So when you're feeble, you're weak, you're despondent, and uh, you are troubled, you're overwhelmed. But we just go and if we think about the representative nature of the church is to represent Christ, then you say even the feeble would be like David. David was a lion killer, was a bear killer. He destroyed the mentalities of the Philistines by killing Goliath. So David ruled in the midst of his enemies. So it comes to a representational uh, relationship with God that we rule, we rule like Christ. You know, when you look at the life of Christ, he came, even though he was a ruler, but he came as a servant. You don't have to be a big shot to rule. You can just be a humble servant of God. But in your own right, you rule against all the things that come against you. All you've got to do is just know that God said, Take charge. God says to us, govern. Just like himself. He says the heaven is throne. The throne is not a dwelling place. A lot of people say heaven is a dwelling place. No, heaven is where he rules from. It's his throne. Where he governs from. Controls the sun and the moon and the tides and the sea and all that. He controls it from his throne rules from his throne and we can say today all the nasty things that are happening it's not happening that he's out of control all the, the atrocities the pedophilia and a whole lot of other things greed and, and uh, you know uh, uh, hostility in governments across the world nations against nations all these things are happening it's not because God is not in control it is because his word is also coming to pass. He says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. And yet it is. We're living in a time of peril where men shall be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. We're living in time of peril where there should be wars and rumors of wars and all that that is happening. But God is still in control. We need to encourage ourselves to know that God is in control in a representable relationship with the Father. He is in control. We, we understand and we see from Scripture that God was saying, uh, uh, Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he was, he was very troubled. He was distressed when he saw the cup. And he said to the Father, Father, this is, for me, it's, it's so bad. Uh, if please, you can remove this cup from me. But you see, because of a relationship that he had with the Father, that they <laughs> said covenantally that he's going to go and he's going to die as a man so that man can be reconciled back to the Father. And yet again, you said that 
his representative relationship with the father was, nevertheless, not what I want. If I can do away with this cup, it'll be nice for me. But it's not my will, but your will be done. See again, it's representational where Jesus is saying to the Father that not what he wants is representing the Father because it was the Father's will that the Father wanted to relate to the human race. And Jesus said, let me go. I'm going to go, I have to do it. When Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, saw, uh, is, he saw himself and he saw the people. And when God put a coal of fire on his tongue and gave him and purified his, his tongue because he lived amongst unclean people. And the Bible says, when the Lord asks, whom shall I send and who will go for me? Then Isaiah said, Lord, Jeremiah, send me. So Jesus said the same thing to the Father. Send me. It was relational that he had to go and make a completion of that which he covenanted with his Father to finish. And you know what? When he did this, when he came, he died and he was persecuted, he was ridiculed, he took stripes and he went to the cross. In the beginning, right in the beginning, with him and his father, he said, Father, I'm going to go down and I'm going to finish it. All. So we find it's a relation. Again, you see, it's now a relationship between God, uh, Jesus Christ, the Son, and God the Father. And then he said he's going to finish it. And when he came on, uh, on, on the cross, when he, when he died, when he gave up the ghost, he surrendered his life to to the Father, and then he said, it is finished. That which he said to the Father, I'll go down and I'll finish the work of reconciliation that man would come back to be able to talk to you and to come into your closet and to come and sit in your bosom. And Jesus came and finished it all up. And that was because of a relationship that he had with his father. Now, what about us in the church? It's something that we have to do in order to produce and to show the relationship of the mystery of Christ and his church. So we said the first thing we did was a caring relationship. The second thing that we had to dwell, it's an habitational relationship. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow. And then we said the united relationship and we covered a, a little bit of a representative relationship. Now we spoke mostly about uh, Jesus representing the Father on the earth as his Father's Son, as the divine Son of the divine God. But also it's very representational when we now have uh, to represent God as the one body. See, Christ came and as a one body, now represent Christ. We must be able to say it's no longer I will live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live not after the flesh, but after the spirit. See, that becomes representational that we are not only uh, normal uh, beings, but we are also spiritual beings representing Christ and the Father who are spirits. You see how that representation comes in? We represent Christ as spiritual people. Jesus said, I am holy. You too must be holy. I am separated, you two must be separated. And that is representational. So we thank God for his word that we could talk about uh, 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 the church. How does the church in the 21st century represent Christ? 
And we've had a few things that we spoke about, like a caring relationship. Uh, we spoke about dwelling relationship, habitational or dwelling relationship, united relationships, and representative relationships. So we got to represent Christ and represent the body on the earth. So in order for the mystical union of Christ and the church to be seen, that's the ultimate church of Christ where we get together in all the various things that which we spoke about. So we just want to pray before we uh, take the communion. And uh, for those of us who uh, render your offerings, we probably put it on the on the on the chat uh, later on. Uh, there will be a uh, put our banking details where you can uh, place your offerings unto the Lord. So we're going to pray. We're going to ask Tina to pray and pray also for the communion. Father, we thank you this morning that we can come to the table of the Lord and we celebrate that you came to the earth, that you gave your body uh, to be crushed and that you give your uh, blood to wash our skin so far. We pray in Jesus' name that we can really understand what it means that Jesus offered his blood unto us. Father, and we pray for all the, uh, the offerings that will come in, that will be provided and will be bringing glory to your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let us partake the body. Well, blessings to all of you um, till we meet again, uh, Tuesday night Bible studies, and uh, well, of course, next week again. God bless you, and bye for now. Bye-bye.